Welcome to The Prescription, the Tax Policy Center's biweekly webcast on fiscal policy. This is one of a series of conversations with state, local, and federal government officials, as well as leading economists and other experts. I'm your host, Howard Gleckman, a senior fellow at TPC and editor of our blog, TaxFox. My guest today is Len Berman. Len is an institute fellow at the Urban Institute and 20 years ago was co-founder of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. Len was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Treasury for Tax Analysis and is the past president of the National Tax Association. Len is also the co-author with Joel Slemrod, who is another one of our guests, of Taxes in America, What Everyone Needs to Know, and author of The Labyrinth of Capital Gains Tax Policy, A Guide for the Perplexed, and an author of hundreds of other articles. We'll be talking today about the debt limit, which is a topic that nobody really ever wants to talk about. Uh, before we begin, a bit of housekeeping. We encourage audience members to submit questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The event is being recorded and will be posted online at TPC's website in the near future. We're using captioning, which you can adjust or turn off with the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you'd like to join the conversation on social media, please use the hashtag live at urban. And if you'd like to suggest a future guest for the prescription, just email us at info at taxpolicycenter.org. Len Berman, welcome to The Prescription. Thank you for having me, Howard. It's an honor to be on. It's good to see you, and I'm glad we could give people something to do other than to sit around and wait for Congress to pass a short-term budget bill. Um, let's start at the beginning. What's the debt limit, and why should normal people care about it? Uh, the debt limit is a statutory limit on the amount of money that the federal government can borrow. Uh, it's, it's been in place since World War I. It was actually put in place to make it easier to, to handle cash flow during, during the war, but it's turned into this political, political instrument uh, used to try to extract uh, concessions from whichever party is, is in power. Uh, it's never been very effective at that, but it actually creates real costs for the economy. And that's why we should care about it. And particularly with our economy right now, uh, teetering on the brink of recession, uh, playing debt limit roulette is an extremely dangerous game. So we don't know for sure, but the best estimates are the debt limit is probably going to be reached sometime next summer or maybe next fall, which is you know nine or 10 months from now. So why do you argue that we need to, we need to address it now? Uh, well, First of all, the, the Democrats who seem to be in agreement that the debt limit is not productive uh, have a few more weeks where they're in control of Congress and they could potentially uh, fix this as part of uh, part of the budget reconciliation and the rules that govern the budget uh, with only Democratic votes in the next few weeks. Uh, and uh, I don't, I say that and I kind of sound partisan and I don't want to sound partisan. But the Republicans who are going to be taking control of the House uh, have signaled that they want to use the debt limit as a way to control Social Security and Medicare costs, among other things. And I think it's actually, I think it's a good idea to do something to fix Social Security and Medicare's finances. But the debt limit is not going to accomplish it. They're not going to get the Democrats to sign on to this. And there's the potential for a protracted standoff that would entail large costs to the economy, potentially could be catastrophic. So, so let me play devil's advocate for a minute. As, as you noted, ultimately we're gonna to have to do something about Medicare and social security. Um, the public debt is $24 trillion. Uh, you've written about the consequences of what you call catastrophic budget failure if we don't deal with the budget deficit. You've described inflation in fact as implicit default so in, in, in all those circumstances, what's wrong with the idea of Republicans raising the attention of the public and their Democratic colleagues and saying, we have to do something about these issues? There's nothing wrong with them saying we have to do something about these issues. The, the, the thing that's wrong is using the debt limit as, as a way to accomplish that. It has never worked. We've been through this many, many times in the past. And the problem is that the consequences of reaching the limit, staying there for a sustained period of time, and potentially defaulting on the debt are really catastrophic. I, 
I mean, when I wrote uh, with co-authors that catastrophic budget failure article, we said we have no idea when the situation, when, when budget catastrophe could occur. We didn't think it was soon, but at some point the deck had become so high uh, and uh, international lenders would lose so much confidence in the government's ability to pay, pay the debt back that interest rates on the debt could just explode. And that's not in the interest of people who wanna cut government spending or cut taxes uh, because uh, if, say, if interest rates increase by a percentage point, uh, that's, I think, $250 billion a year in additional interest costs at the current level of the debt. Uh, and potentially, interest rates can go up a lot higher. We can actually get to the point where, uh, because investors uh, doubt the ability or willingness of, Ameri of the American government to make its debt payments, uh, they would say we need, basically we need to price US debt like junk bonds. Uh, interest rates will go up and then they redo their calculations and say, well, actually at junk bond interest rates, the US government couldn't make their debt payments even if they wanted to. And that's the situation where basically the market for treasuries would just shut down. Uh, and we would immediately have to massively raise taxes and cut spending. It's just not, it's, it's you know, I. I suppose if your only goal is to cut spending, that would work, but it would work at the cost of a second Great Depression for the US, uh, potentially bringing the whole world economy down with us. Uh, and we'd have really high taxes as well. But I suppose the other, the, the counter argument is for decades, we've been unable to get Congress to act on, on the, the budget deficit. It takes a crisis to get Congress to do anything. Mm -hmm. So why not create the threat of what you just described to force Congress to finally take the budget deficit seriously? Well, it's not worked. The, the, how many times have we done it over the last 30 years? You know, 10 or 20 times? It's not worked in the past. We put in place budget rules, which then Congress uh, circumvents because they actually like spending money and they like cutting taxes. Uh, so it doesn't work. And it might be that Okay, maybe, maybe the negotiators who want fiscal discipline would really, really dig their heels in, but the, that's, I think that's the scariest situation because it's hard to imagine that the other side wouldn't be digging their heels in. And you know, when these things happen, there's a political calculus as to who's gonna get blamed for this. And if the Democrats decide the Republicans are gonna get blamed for it, they might be willing to keep the game going up to the point of disaster. Uh, and it's just, it's a, it's a scary scenario. And I should point out that even if we don't have a disastrous outcome, and we haven't the last 20 times this has come up, we have had outcomes that have raised costs for the US government. Uh, for one thing, you know, uh, just, the, just the threat of default pushes up interest rates. Uh, there was a, situation in 1979 when there was a computer programming error and one set of bonds that came due were not paid off immediately. And this cost the government, you know, something like $60 billion in, 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 current, in current dollars in terms of higher interest costs going forward. Uh, the idea that this wouldn't be an accidental default, but that actually the government would be deliberately putting us at risk of a future default could push up interest rates a whole lot more than that. There are other costs, you know, so there, you know, there's there's a toolkit. Actually, there's there's a plan apparently it's put in place in 2011 uh, for what, what government would do as the debt limit standoff continued. First, they would use their extraordinary measures. We put that in quotes, uh, not really extraordinary, we do it all the time, but that's basically they borrow from, uh, government employees' pension plans and do other things like that to try to keep paying their bills. Uh, when those measures are exhausted, then the next thing is it starts prioritizing what's gonna pay off. I think most people don't think that the government would stop making payments on the debt right away. It's actually in the constitution that we have to do that. Uh, but when they do that, uh, the people who aren't getting paid uh, will sue the government. And then we, we're leaving it up to the courts to decide what spending happens and when. 
which is kind of a frightening thought. Uh, and the meanwhile, you know, if we're if we're stiffing our creditors and contractors on bills that are due, uh, that's going to raise costs for them. It might put some of them out of business. And and if they do business with the government in the future, they're going to say we need to get paid more to account for this risk. And there are lots of other, and of course, there are all the costs of just what the government has to do to implement these extraordinary measures, wasting a huge amount of staff resources and other uh, other costs. So we can get into the details of that in a couple of minutes, but I wanna ask you one other question about the sort of the process here. So legislative hostage taking isn't anything new, right? I mean, Democrats say they'll refuse to extend or restore some popular corporate breaks unless Republicans agree to restore a more generous version of the child tax credit. We're, we're mm -hmm. saying that now. So is, is, is the problem with the tactic or is your problem with that the, the debt limit is sort of the nuclear option. It's, it's, it's not the hostage taking, it's the sort of the nature of the hostage that's being taken. Is that, is that what's really got you bothered the most? Or does the hostage taking bother you too? I mean, the regular horse trading that goes on between parties and between members of Congress to advance legislation, that's, that's built into our system. And I think that's actually normal. Uh, and I think it's perfectly reasonable to talk about priorities and whether we should expand the child tax credit or not. The hostage in the case of the debt limit is the world economy and certainly the US economy. Uh, so yeah, it's it, the answer is the, your, your, your second point. This is the nuclear option. And I don't think we would want to do that. So uh, I'm sure you saw Catherine Rampell did a nice column in the Washington Post about this. And she likened what would happen to horror film, and this is how she described it. A maniac has pledged to commit carnage, but rather than taking common sense precautions, the other characters keep making dumb, short-sighted decisions, walking straight into the spooky basement. So, so what you describe uh, is, is nothing new. It's not as if people on the Hill don't know what you've been talking about. So why do you think it is that Democrats have it appears are taking a pass on this, and they're going to we're going to they're going to let this come to a crisis next year. Well, because they're well, first of all, they have other things they want to do during the lame duck session. They could have dealt with this earlier, but they didn't. Uh, I don't. The problem is that raising the debt ceiling makes it sound like you're in favor of debt, and that's certainly the way it's portrayed by the other side when it happens. So, I. I mean, it's certainly one implication of your question is that there's plenty of blame to go around on this. In a rational world, there would have been a bipartisan agreement uh, to members of Congress that this is just not the way we're gonna try to control spending. Uh, the way you control spending is you control spending. Say, you know, like Social Security, uh, cut other programs that you don't think you can afford. The debt limit doesn't do that though. So to stick with Catherine's metaphor, you know, we, we've, we've both been to this movie many times before. And in the end, Congress always extends the debt limit before the government borrowing authority expires. Uh, so so is, is there a little bit of the boy who cries wolf here? Are you, are you, are, are, do, do you think that, uh, that somehow it's going to be different next year? Or, or are we going to get to, you know, two days before the debt limit expires? And in the end, they're just going to do what they do all the time. I hope I'm the boy who cries wolf. Uh, things do sound different now. I mean, the fact that the chairman of the, or the incoming chairman of the Ways and Means Committee has said that he wants to use the debt limit as a way to control the spending priorities, uh, I, I think is a, is a concern. The fact that uh, Mr. McCarthy's assuming he is elected spe speaker, he's going to have a pretty precarious hold on the speakership. Republicans have what, you know, four or five vote majority in the House. Uh, and they're members of his caucus who seem to want to use the debt limit regardless of what happens in the interim. That they, I mean, they, they think spending's out of control. It's a perfectly reasonable position to, to hold. Uh, and I think they're willing to go for the nuclear option uh, and they might have enough leverage over the new speaker that the standoff would last a lot longer than it has in the past. I'm, 
I mean, I'm, I'm hoping it won't play out that way. I mean, the, the reason that the debt that the debt limit is never the debt bomb has never exploded, exploded before is because the consequences of doing it are just too horrible to imagine. And I think people understand that. And I think that's certainly true for, I mean, the thing we don't know is there, you know, obviously there, there are moderates on both sides who understand this uh, and they wouldn't want to do this, but I don't know how it plays out. You're actually the, you're the more seasoned political observer than I am. What do you think? So, so the interesting thing to me is Congress can make mischief in two ways, right? It can make mischief by, by, by commission, by passing bills that are mischievous, and then it can make mischief by not doing anything. Right. And what troubles me about this is, is simply by inaction, right. the, the bomb goes off. Right. But I do wonder, uh, you know, we, we've, we've all seen stories in recent days about there is a, a, a group of moderate House Republicans, maybe mm -hmm. as many as 50 of them, who, who are, appear to be coming together and, and, and showing some willingness to push for, for, for their priorities. Right. And, and one wonders whether or not, you know, in the end, uh, those Republicans get together with the Democrats and, and get some sort of a debt limit passed. Now, that still requires a discharge petition from a committee or whatever they have to do to get the bill on the floor. But I, 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 in my optimistic moments, I wonder, could, could that happen again? And could all of this angst sort of be unnecessary. It, it could. And I, I think the, the positive that the, I just read an article today about how those 50 Republicans are trying to protect Speaker McCarthy from a provision that would make it easy to remove him from, from, from his speakership. Uh, I think if that happens, then I think uh, Speaker McCarthy would be more likely to ultimately uh, acquiesce to some kind of sensible policy, at least before the debt limit hit. I don't know. The problem is I don't think either party wants to have their fingerprints on a permanent fix to the debt limit because of that, because it's so easy to demagogue the issue. And you know, thing I think everybody needs to repeat again and again and again is the debt limit is not what causes the debt. What causes the debt is that we spend more money than we bring in in tax revenues. And you can fix that in two ways. <laughs> right. right. You, know, so you, can't, you, can't fix, you can't fix it by, by you know, standing back on the debt limit. I mean, you know, if we actually do hit the debt limit, it's true that spending would have to stop for, or get slowed down for a little while, but we have to pay it back. Uh, so it doesn't even save money on the... And then, you know, we decide to, to, to stiff the contractors who we've made up, made, made promises to, we're still going to pay Boeing back for the things that we contracted with them to do. And they're probably going to expect us to pay more in the future because their cost to them of having, you know, their biggest customer be a deadbeat. So they'll build it into their contract prices. Yeah. 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 So let, let's talk about some of the consequences of, of, of the debt bomb actually exploding. And at the most extreme, could you imagine the U.S. losing its status as global reserve currency? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the reason that the dollar is the global reserve currency is it's perceived to be completely safe. Uh, U.S. debt is the world's safe asset. We pay, our government pays something like a quarter percentage point less in interest uh, on, on debt than other, other rich countries do. Uh, the other countries want to. Other countries hold U.S. dollars in the form of treasury securities. Uh, they're perfectly happy to be them for them to be denominated in dollars because they perceive them to be safe. That could change. Uh, and and of course, you know, if if the U.S. if U.S. treasuries are no longer perceived to be safe, then interest rates will go up at least by that quarter percentage point, probably by more. And as we mentioned, possibly by a whole lot more. And that's just additional money that we're gonna to have to spend, additional money that's gonna be added to the debt in the future that doesn't buy anything for us. So our colleague, Gene Sterling wrote a, a, a tax box blog a while ago that described, I think in a, in a really uh, good way, the Hobson's choice that a debt limit breach leaves the president. So on one hand, through its enacted budget, Congress requires the president to spend all appropriated funds, uh, even when spending exceeds what treasury collects in revenues, which of course is the situation we've been in for decades. A Nixon era law though, 
prohibits the president from refusing to spend money appropriated by Congress. On the other hand, breaching the debt limit would bar Treasury from borrowing money to run the programs that Congress demands. So which law does the president break? There's an impossible set of constraints. I and mean, part of the problem is we don't actually know what would happen. Uh, and whatever choice the government makes, there are gonna be some parties who are hurt by those, those choices. Uh, for example, if we're not paying off our contractors and then things could go to the courts and who knows what the courts will decide when they all of a sudden are in control of the US budget. Because one possibility is that uh, the president could just say uh, <clears throat> that the debt limit can't be binding because it creates an impossible set of constraints. The constitution says we have to make payments on the US debt. So I'm just gonna ignore it. There's a, I saw an article by a law professor who said that he thought that might work. That's gonna go, if that happened, it would go to court. There'd certainly be screams of executive overreach if the president did that. Uh, but I guess, you know, in some sense, it's interesting, you know, if we survive it, we, we have great stories to, to tell in the future, but not a game we should play. <laughs> so let, let's put, you, you've alluded to this before, but let's put this in the, in the context of our current economic situation. We're in a period of high inflation and relatively high interest rates. Our relationship with China, which is our largest creditor, is fraught. Uh, by next fall, we and most of the rest of the world could be in a recession. Are there special risks to breaching the debt limit in this environment that, that, that weren't there in, in past adventures like this? Yes. I mean, the, with the economy, if, certainly if we're going into recession, a big cut in spending, uh, a big cut, even if it doesn't result in a permanent reduction in spending, but a big cut in, disburse, in disbursements to the contractors where the money from the government would be really contractionary. Contract, contractors, if it lasted for a while, would have to lay off some employees. That's not something you want to happen when you're going into a recession. Uh, the, we basically finance 20% of our expenses with borrowed money now. So an immediate cut of our federal budget by about 20% would be hugely contractionary. It would also be really uneven. That would have, we'd have to cut spending by more when revenues weren't coming into treasury very quickly. Uh, and we could have, you know, you know, big party in April and all the income tax returns are filed. It's a terrible way to, 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 to perform fiscal policy. So the, we, we had an interesting conversation uh, recently with another guest who talked about his conversations with the financial markets uh, about this, and they're very sanguine about it. Their attitude is, as I described before, ah, this is just Washington, and in the end, they're just going to do this. Can you imagine a situation where the financial markets fracture even before the debt limit is breached, uh, just because suddenly the attitude of, of, of the, the, the traders changes and they feel, you know, a few days or a few weeks before, oh, crap, this is this could really happen. Could we have a could we have a, a financial crisis even before the debt limits breached? And Bob Schiller and George Akerlof wrote a book about animal spirits, uh, basically said that a, a lot of what motivates markets is perceptions that uh, that can be self-fulfilling. But. So right now everybody thinks, well, we're safe. So the animal spirits are with us. That could change right away. I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not a financial market expert. Uh, I don't, but I'm not sure anybody can predict when those perceptions change. But the, the same things, the same things that make us safe right now, uh, keep treasury interest rates really, really low, could change very, very quickly. Think about the the housing market bubble. I wrote about this in the catastrophic budget failure article. Uh, for a while, uh, financial market or you know, financial institutions thought they could lend money to anybody to buy a house, and it was a safe investment because housing prices were going up so quickly. Which, by the way, was happening because they were lending to anybody who said they wanted to own a home. Uh, all of a sudden that changed. And they said, well, maybe lending money with no actual sources of income is not such a great investment. So they started becoming more selective in their lending. Uh, they stopped thinking that lending to anybody was safe. And, and instantly that became true because housing prices stopped their explosion and started going down. Uh, the, same thing, the same thing could happen for treasuries that you know, as long as everybody thinks treasuries are safe, they will be safe and they'll be cheap because the government can borrow at a low rate. As soon as people start wondering whether they're safe anymore, 
uh, that that could also be a self-fulfilling a self-fulfilling idea and interest rates would go up and that would confirm the theory that treasuries aren't safe. So then we spent a while talking about everything that could go wrong. Let's spend the last few minutes that we have talking about how to fix this. Uh -huh. um, there are a number of options out there, uh, everything from trillion dollar platinum coins to restoring the, uh, the old rule that, that, uh, that, that Dick Gebhardt developed. Talk a little bit about what you think about these various options and which of them are plausible and which of them are crazy. Uh, trillion dollar gold, trillion dollar coin, crazy, implausible. Uh, the, just imagine the hate mail I'm gonna get for that. Uh, <laughs> the, just, I mean, I think we should just eliminate the debt, the debt ceiling. I think if, if the purpose of the debt ceiling is to put Congress on the record is actually authorizing the additional borrowing that goes with additional expenditures, the Gephardt rule, which you mentioned, uh, is the way to do it. That was, I think that was in place until about 1995, said when Congress authorizes new expenditures or new tax, next, new tax cuts, it has to also authorize the additional debt that goes with that. Like I said before, the, the thing that increases the debt is the legislation that raises spending or cuts taxes. So at that point, Congress should explicitly acknowledge that they're willing to pay that debt. Would another option, which is just raise the debt ceiling significantly so it gets us into say 2025, is that, is that another alternative? Doesn't solve the problem, but at least kicks the can down the road. Yeah, ask me about that in 2025. <laughs> That's, I mean, in the current environment, that might be the best we could hope for. Uh, and, you know, I guess the positive part about that is you could have the next presidential election could be about who would do best at managing the debt and other priorities that voters have, let people vote on it. But the problem is we will hit the debt limit again. And, it'll be, and at that point, our debt will be higher than it is now. Potentially, we'll be more exposed than we are in the current environment. Uh, and it's hard to imagine that the, the quality of the debate on the issue would, be, would improve in the intervening two or three years. So let's go back to where we started. If creating a crisis like this is not the way to address the budget deficit, and if all the things that we've tried in the last 20 years are not the way to reduce the budget deficit, how do we get Congress to finally face up to issues of the deficit and the debt? That is the hardest question you've asked me. I mean, part of the problem is that I think politicians and the public don't really perceive the cost of additional debt as being especially high relative to the value of cutting taxes or the value of increasing spending. Uh, as long as it seems like borrowing is, is free, uh, it's easy for politicians to satisfy their constituents, which comes by giving away things, not taking them, taking them back. Uh, there was, in the early 1980s, we had uh, what was perceived to be too much debt after the Reagan, first Reagan tax cuts. And Wall Street actually came to the president and said, these tax these deficits are pushing up interest rates and they're killing us. You need to do something about the deficit. And the president reluctantly agreed to tax increases and some spending cuts as a way to control, can, can control the deficit. Uh, if people saw, the problem is that, you know, it's all, it's in the intervening years, it seemed like the costs of fiscal irresponsibility were born way far in the future, whereas the benefits were immediate. Well, Lynn Berman, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a, a, a wonderful pre-holiday conversation about how things could really go south for the country. Um, I just want to remind all of our viewers, thank you for joining us, of course. And this is our last prescription for the year. Uh, we'll be back on January 5th. And best wishes for happy holiday season to everyone. Thanks, Howard. Happy holidays. <laughs>